Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining me, brother. Uh, and uh, Lashonda, God bless you. Thank you for joining tonight. This is a, a good day because the Lord allowed us to be here one more time. I'm excited tonight about what God is going to do in our lessons for the next few weeks or so. Um, we're going to be discussing the battlefield of the mind. Am I coming across clear? Am I coming across clear? Someone can just um, send me a message back if you can hear me real good. Amen. God bless you, Cousin Marilyn. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Well, praise the Lord. I'm glad you all joined me tonight. We're going to open up in prayer in just a moment. You know, I had a chance uh, throughout the day just to relax and also to meditate on God's word and just uh, hear his voice. Because a lot of times we get so distracted with ourselves and the things that's going on around us. We don't take time to be quiet. That's one thing God had to teach me years ago is learn how to sit and be quiet sometimes. Don't answer the phone. Don't do a whole lot of talking. Just sit down and be quiet. Sometimes the best thing we can do when we don't know what to do is be still and know that God is God. He's in control and be quiet and listen to his voice. And I tell you, when you listen to his voice, God will begin to give you instruction. He'll give you guidance. He'll give you answers to situations that you're trying to figure out. He'll begin to convey his heart to you to remind you how much he loves you unconditionally. And it doesn't matter what you've been going through, what you've been through. He is the answer of everything that we face in life. He is the solution. And God has a remedy for all of our problems that we go through in this life. But sometimes we get to in a hurry. We don't want to be quiet and listen. So we talk too much. And I was just thinking this, this evening concerning the subject, the battlefield of the mind. And as God has instructed me to, to teach from this book, the battlefield of the mind, I guarantee there's something going to be said or done that's going to enlighten you and make you more aware of how to govern your thought life. So many times our thought life governs us in a negative way because of what we allow to enter into our ear gates. Not only our ear gates, but our eye gates, because all these things, the five senses work together. The sight, the hearing, the smell, the taste, the touch, all these senses, they work together and they also work together in the spiritual aspect. Because whatever you allow to be the center focus of your life is what's going to guide you, is going to govern you, it's going to direct you in a positive way or a negative way. And it's up to you to make a decisive decision what thought you're going to entertain in your life. So God has, has instructed me to, to go through the book, The Battlefield of the Mind. If you have that book, you can follow along in that book if you have the book, The Battlefield of the Mind. If you don't have that book, I suggest getting that book because I, I know without a shadow of a doubt that this book, by Joyce Myers, it's going to enrich your thought life. It's going to change your thinking. It's going to change the way you view yourself. Even the, the confessions that you allow to come out of your mouth is going to change from reading this book. I read this book once already, and as God instructed me to go through this book again, I pray that something will help you grow in your spiritual walk with the Lord. Because we all need the Lord in our lives. God bless you, Webster. We all need the Lord in our lives, and we need him to help us to stay on the right track. But without God, we're defenseless. We're vulnerable to the enemy's tactics and his, his assaults and his assassinations he brings against us as believers. So it's up to us to make a decision within ourselves that, you know what? I'm going to order my thought life according to the way God has ordained it to be, according to his word. 
When you get the word inside of you, the word of God will begin to show you the direction that you need to think. You hear what I just said? The direction you need to think. Not just go, but your direction. You now, if you get into a certain place, it's governed by the way you think. So if I think I'm never going to make it to my destination, I'm going to always be running late on my job assignments. I'm always never be on time getting to work. I'm always have excuses. Your thought life is governed by your confession. And your confession comes from your thought life. So both those things work together. And we're going to get into that in just a moment. But I want to open up in prayer and then we're going to get into our lesson tonight. So Lord God, I thank you that you are great. You do miracles so great. You're sovereign. You're holy. You are majestic. You're, you're, you're the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And God, we're honored to come into your presence. Tonight, Lord God, I ask that you speak to our hearts by divine revelation. Break the chains and the shackles off our minds that we would have free access into the wisdom, the knowledge, the understanding from the word of God to receive instructions from your heart, God, on how we need to govern our lives according to our thought life. I thank you, Lord God, as we die to ourselves tonight and live according to the word of God to hear your voice, that you say, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. Speak, Lord, by your word. And I thank you, Lord God, that you free up our minds tonight, O oh God, that we'll be able to receive the word of God, unhindered, unchecked by any demonic force. And Father, I bind up every assault, every attack, every assassination, every assignment the enemy bringing against your people from receiving this word tonight, O oh God. And I thank you that you give us, Father God, free access to receive this word by faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. I'm going to read something, a daily devotion I read about uh, last year sometime. It's called Our Thought Life. Our Thought Life. And it says, all seeds of thoughts produce a tree of results. If those thoughts are rooted in aggravation, then a tree of aggra aggravation springs forth. And the same would be true with depression. I remember that during the years I struggled on and off with depression, I would purposely think thoughts that made me depressed or would allow myself to dwell on those thoughts, never knowing that I was producing my own tree. You hear what I just said? The more you dwell on aggravation, depression, anxiety, mental torment, you produce a tree, tree of results. Whatever it is you allow to come into your thought life and you allow yourself to speak that thing into existence, it produces a tree which brings forth the fruit of whatever you have spoken out of your mouth. Then it goes and said, I would perfectly think thoughts that may be depressed or allow myself to dwell on those thoughts, never knowing that I was producing it, my own tree. For some reason, I couldn't connect the dots. I was blinded when I was driving along in my car. My mind would grab hold of a negative and depressive thought. My mind was attracting these negative thoughts until I found myself being agitated and aggravated. And a cloud of depression would begin to hover over me. And yet I had no idea that I was the actual person manufacturing this cloud. I struggled for a long time until I found a way to get out. It was my desire. And when I got out of that ditch to help others find the way out of the same ditch. That is so powerful. God bless you, brothers, for joining us tonight. That is so powerful because our thought life is going to produce negative results. If that's all you think about. But if you think about positive things that I'm going to be blessed and highly favored of God. I'm going to be healthy. I'm, I'm going to live according to God's word. I'm going to allow the spirit of God to guide and instruct me and counsel me and, and keep me secure in his presence. Guess what happens? You produce a tree of results which bring forth the manifestation of fruit, of righteousness. You can not choose your circumstances, but you can choose your thoughts. Emerson an old scholar once said, a man is what he thinks about all the time. You would be shocked 
if you could record your thoughts all day and then play them back in the evening. You would be shocked to discover that the thoughts that you gravitated towards may be the very source of many problems in your life. Norman Vincent Peale once said, a man is not what he thinks he is, but what he thinks he is. You hear what I just said? A man is not what he thinks he is. I'm not talking about man and gender. I'm talking about man, female, uh -oh, child, doesn't matter who you are. Whatever thought that you give the most power or influence over to in your life, the ones you gravitate to, the one you meditate on the most. He says a man is not what he thinks he is, but what he thinks he is. Marcus Aurelius a great philosopher who ruled over Roman Empire said it in eight easy words. Our lives are what our thoughts make it. If you don't like your life, examine your thoughts. He also wanted to say the soul is dyed of the color of its thoughts. So whatever it is you allow yourself to meditate on the most and to speak about the most, it says your life. It's going to become just what you've been thinking about. Our lives are what our thoughts make it. So if you think yourself, I said this years ago, a few years ago, when I was going through cancer, the Lord says, if you think yourself sick, God bless you, Monica. God bless you, uh, 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 God bless everyone for joining tonight. But the thing is, if you think about yourself being sick, the more you give power to those words out of your mouth because it went into the origination of your thought life. Whatever you allow in your thought life to come out of your mouth, you end up with results. So if I think myself sick, guess what happens? I get sicker. The more I magnify the thought life of being ill, I gravitate other things into my life that will produce a harvest of sickness. So I begin to fall apart. My life is messed up. My life becomes a wretch. Everything is not good in my life. I get arthritis. I get back pains. I get neck pains. I get joint pains. I get all kinds of illnesses because I meditate on those things the most. Guess what happened to me? I, I, I always tell myself, even though my, I have a problem with my shoulders, because uh, I have, you know, I have another bulging disc in my neck. And I got to the point, I said, Lord, your word says that Jesus paid the price on the cross for my sickness. So you tells me in your word that he, by his stripes, we're healed. And if he says that we're healed by his stripes and his blood has cleansed us from all sin, then Lord, I make a bold confession today that my body is healed in the name of Jesus. I command my shoulder pain, my neck pain to loose me and let me go. Sure enough, the pain might be still there at the moment. But the more I meditate on God's word, guess what? I stop thinking about the pain. Before you know it, the pain is gone. You didn't realize the pain was gone. I had this happen yesterday. I, I was in so much pain yesterday. And I begin to meditate on the goodness of God. I begin to tell my body, body, the Lord says you are healed in the name of Jesus. And I made that confession. I said, body, you shall line up with the word of God and be healed. True enough, the problems are there. True enough, the situations are there. But we have the power in our tongues to make a decision to either give in to it or, or receive it or reject it. And I choose to reject sickness. I choose to reject body pains. I choose to reject lower back pains and knee pains and all this stuff that tries to attach itself to my organs. Even though it's there, I still don't give it the power to take control of my entire body because I keep standing on the word of God. I keep exercising. I keep doing things practical to make myself feel better. Hear what I just said? That means you got to have faith with works. Faith without works is dead. But if you have your faith mixed with works, the works will cause a manifestation of the faith to be activated in your body and you get the results of what you've been thinking about. So it says the soul is dyed with the color of thoughts. So what are you coloring your life with? Think about it. What are you coloring your life with? Are you coloring your life with a pale shade of gray? 
and black and this small colors, those dull colors? Or are you coloring your life with a rainbow? Joy, health, excitement, enthusiasm, optimism, goodwill. It's up to you. I have always enjoyed one of the modern translations explained in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. Be careful how you think. Your life is shaped by your thoughts. Your body, your life is shaped by your thoughts. So, not only that, today is a good day to begin to redefine and reposition yourself uh, through thinking good thoughts that spring forth from a relationship with God. Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep thine heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. It's up to you, my brother, my sister, to determine what your life is going to become by your thought life. It's up to you to make a decisive decision. That I'm going to guard my heart, which means I'm going to guard my confession. I'm going to guard my thought life. I'm going to guard my ear gates. I'm going to guard my eye gates. So whatever I allow to come into me, I'm going to choose to decipher through the filter of the Holy Spirit the things that are righteous and unrighteous, things that are good and the things that are bad. I'm not going to give those things power over me because my life is in the hands of the Lord. So you have a choice and you got to make a decision and you got to allow the word of God to govern your life. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Romans chapter 7 verse 25. So it's up to you to determine what is going to be the outcome of your life. The word of God, or you're going to be governed by your own, own intellect, your own emotions, your own feelings, your own way of thinking. <clears throat> so our book tonight, The Battles of the Mind, the introduction, it starts off with the weapons of our warfare are not physical weapons of the flesh and blood, but they are mighty before God to overthrow and destruction of strongholds inasmuch as well we refute arguments and theories and reasonings and every proud and lofty thing that sets itself up against the true knowledge of God. And we lead every thought and purpose away captive into obedience of Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. And that's in <clears throat> Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 and 5. So we got to make a decision that we're going to put on our full armor of God as Ephesians 6 and 10 to stand against the wiles of the devil. But not only that, we're going to recognize that we're in a spiritual warfare. This is not a physical warfare. It's a spiritual warfare. We talked about last week, additional advice to overcome the spiritual warfare. And one of the things was discernment. And another point was having, having uh, the, the gift of the spirit, walking in truth. You got to be in the place where you get in the word of God and begin to meditate, decipher, get the word of God inside of you till that word becomes part of your life. The life that we live, we no longer live according to the dictates of the flesh, but we live by the spirit of the living God. So how can we express the importance of our thoughts sufficiently in order, in order to convey the true meaning of Proverbs 23, chapter 23, verse 7? For as he is, a person thinks in his heart, so is he. The longer I serve God and study his word, the more I realize the importance of thought, the words, on a fairly regular basis, I find the Holy Spirit leading me to study in these areas. So the more you get into the word of God, the more you realize how important it is to keep the word in your heart and in your mouth. Because you got to get to the place within yourself where you meditate on the word of God. You speak the word of God. You stand on the word of God. You know the word of God. You study the word of God until that word gets in your spirit. So when the enemy does come along with something negative, you will automatically identify it in the first chance it comes to present itself to you. 
Because the spirit inside of you, the Holy Spirit, who leads us into all truth, Jesus told us, he said, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. But he said, the comforter, when he comes, he will guide you into all truth. Why? Because unless we have a comforter in our hearts, we'll never walk in the pathway of truth and righteousness. We got to get in the word of God and allow the word of God to get into our spirits. Because without that word in our spirits, we leave ourselves defenseless. We leave ourselves open. You need to leave the gateway where the enemy have access in and out of your life to do just what he chooses to do to destroy you. Jesus says in John, St. John chapter 15, verse 5, actually verse 4, it says, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit itself, except it abides in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. So if you want to produce righteous fruit out of your life with a benefit, is healing, deliverance, victory, overcoming, faithfulness, stewardship unto the word of God, serving the Lord with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your will, your emotions, your strength, everything about you connected to him. Jesus said, you got to stay connected to the vine. So in order to stay connected to the vine, which is connected to his bloodline, which is himself, you got to change your thinking. Verse uh, 6 says, Matter of fact, verse 5, it says, I am the vine, and ye are the branches. He that abides in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. So in order to overcome your thought life, you got to stay connected to the vine, which is Jesus Christ himself connected to the Father. Once you're connected to him, through the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, so you abide in him, and in him the same bringeth forth much fruit. What fruit? The characteristics of God being revealed through your life, as in Galatians chapter 5, verse 19, to the end of the chapter, talking about the fruit of the Spirit. When you think, stay connected to Him, the characteristics of who He is, it's birthed inside of you and begin to come out of you. Then it goes on and says, I no longer serve God and study His Word. So the long, so the longer I serve God and study His Word, the more I realize the importance of the thoughts and the words. And I've said, and I believe it is true, as, that as long as we are on this earth, we need to study in the areas of thoughts and words. We, we got to study. No matter how much we know in any area, there are always new things to learn. And there are things we have previously learned that we need to be refreshed in. So in other words, it's a progressing in studying. Just because you went to college, got your degree, doesn't mean you have to stop learning. Just because you went to Bible school and learned about the theology and all these different things, the hermeneutics of the, of the gospel truth, doesn't mean you need to stop, stop learning. We're going to continue to keep learning as long as we live on this earth. And, and I remember old saying, say, it's, you're never too old to teach old dog new tricks, which is true because we still can keep learning no matter how old we get. I remember seeing in the news here in Milwaukee, senior citizens, 70 and 80 and 90 years old, graduated from college, which lets us know that you can keep on achieving as high as the sky is the limit, the more you have a determination in yourself that you're not going to stop learning. That's the same way we need to be about God's word. Keep on studying God's word. Keep on meditating on God's word. Keep on breaking up that word, deciphering it, and getting it in your spirit to that word is your life. What does Proverbs 23, verse 7 says? Excuse me. It says, as he, a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Another translation states, as a man thinks in his heart, so does he become. So whatever it is, it takes precedence in your in your thought life. It's what your life is going to pattern after and become. The mind is the leader or forerunner of all actions. Romans 8 chapter, 8 chapter verse 5 makes it clear. For those who are according to the flesh and are controlled by his unholy desires, set their minds on and pursue those things which gratify the flesh. 
And it says, but those who are according to the spirit are controlled by the desires of the spirit, set their minds on and seek those things which gratify the Holy Spirit. That means finds pleasure. That gratifies another word for pleasure, satisfaction. So in other words, you find your satisfaction by the mind of the spirit or you find your satisfaction by the mind of the flesh. It's up to you to make a decision. What are you going to feed in your thought life? What's going to control your thought life? Are you going to let that ill spirit of other people uh, dominate you and control you and cause you to act out of character every time somebody come along and make you mad and say something you don't like? See, that's the thing that comes to our heart. If we're not governed by the Holy Spirit, then we're governed by the enemy. One thing I said in our lesson last week about dealing with the straw man is, and, and, and what he does, whatever the enemy influences you with, there is a spirit behind that spirit. And that spirit is the enemy playing on that thought life of anger, malice, jealousy, hatred, bitterness, lasciviousness, murder, theft, all these different things that are common to human nature, the enemy plays on those thoughts. And that spirit behind him keeps encouraging you to give your attitude to that spirit. Give your lifestyle to that spirit. That's why you got people don't mind hurting one another because they, they it became accustomed to it. The fruit of thought that they've been dwelling on the most and meditated on the most has become part of their life. So if it means hurting somebody and killing somebody, they don't have no, no remorse. Because the mind has been conditioned according to the flesh. That's why it's so important to recognize what attitude am I having today. When you get up in the mornings, do you wake up excited or do you wake up miserable? Do you wake up with a praise in your heart or you wake up complaining? Your day is going to be set in motion by your thought life. Whatever it is you allow yourself to dwell on, the moment you wake up in the morning, are the thoughts that are going to govern your entire day. And many people have a miserable day because they woke up miserable. I choose every day, no matter how tired I be when I wake up in the mornings, I still wake up happy. I still wake up excited. I still wake up with joy in my heart. I praise in my lips because God is worthy to be praised even when I don't feel like it. But the choice is up to us to determine how our day is going to be set a course. Another point is that our actions are a direct result of our thoughts. If we have a negative mind, we will have negative life. If we have a negative mind, we will have a negative life. If, on the other hand, we renew our mind according to God's word, we will, as Romans chapter 12, verse 2 promises, prove out in our experience that good and acceptable and perfect will of God for our lives. The choice is up to you to determine. Am I going to allow my mind to be transformed from the mind of the world to the mind of Christ and be governed by the Holy Spirit to prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God in my life? Or am I going to have a negative life, life and a mindset that's going to keep me living a miserable lifestyle with gloom and doom, never happy, never satisfied, always trying to connect with people for a pity party because I'm miserable. I want you to be miserable because I'm hurt. I want you to be hurt. So we come together seeking people to gratify our pain. We want people to sympathize with our pain, to gratify our pain, to make it bigger, to make it more satisfying. I, so Joyce Myers writing this book says, I have decided this book, and so I divided this book into three main parts. The first part deals with the importance of thoughts. I want to establish firmly in your hearts forever that you need to begin to think about what you're thinking about. That is a very vital point in our lives. We must learn how to think about what you're thinking about. And you might ask the question, what do you mean think about what I'm thinking about? What are you thinking of? What, what is on your mind? What, what's, what seems to be the president thought in your mind at this moment? Think about that thought and then think about the results of that thought. 
So if that thought is not positive, what would results be of that negative thought? So if I allow my mind to be governed with the thought I'm thinking about, my life is going to follow suit out of whatever I've been thinking about. So if I think about righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost and I'm loving on God, I'm, I'm resting in the finished work of the cross, I'm living my life to the full because God said every precious promise he had blessed me that I'm highly favored of God, then guess what happens? If I'm thinking in that line according to God's word, I'm going to get the results of those thoughts. So many people's problems are rooted in thinking patterns that, are actually produce, that actually produce the problem. So you got to examine what, what it is that caused you to think the way you think. Was, was I around somebody? Just like I remember one time in an altar call, we had a young lady who testified a few weeks later that at the altar call, she was holding somebody's hand who must have had a suicidal thought. And that spirit jumped on her. So when she left church, she went home with the thought of killing herself and she began to cry and, and, and wail and, and reach out to people because she felt like killing herself. And the pastor had to go to her house, pray over that individual, and cast that spirit out in the name of Jesus. And the person was right back to their right mind. Because you have to be prayed up when you're praying for people on the altar. If you're not prayed up, whatever spirit is in that person will jump on you. Reminds of the story when, when Paul was talking about, or Peter, one of the apostles, was talking about in the book of Acts about the seven sons of Sceva, how these men tried to mimic what they saw the apostles do. So they wanted to cast out demons in the name of the Jesus that they worship. And it said that the demons jumped on those men and ripped them to shreds and beat them and ran them off naked. So you got to know your authority. That's another point in spiritual warfare, even dealing with the mindset. You got to know your authority. You got to know your right, according to God's word. You must learn what types of thinking are acceptable to the Holy Spirit and what types that are not acceptable. You got to think the thoughts that are healthy and the thoughts that produce life and not death. Death and life is in the power of the tongue. And it says, your belly will be satisfied by the fruit thereof. Why? Because it comes from the thought life. Whatever thought I dwell on is what my mouth is going to confess, either life or death. Jesus puts it this way. He said, the words that I've spoken unto you are spirit in their life. So if Jesus produced life by his words that he spoke, guess what? We can do the same thing. We can produce life by the words we're allowed to speak out of our mouth. Or we can produce death. But we have to make a decision to choose life and live. Joshua told the children of Israel, he said, the Lord set before you life and death. Choose life that you and your, your descendants may live. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 and 5, clearly states that we must know the word of God well enough to be able to compare what is in our minds with what is in the mind of God. Any thoughts that attempt to exalt itself above the word of God, we are to cast down and to bring into captivity to Jesus. You know what I just said? Any thought that attempts to exalt itself above God, we must make a decision to cast it down and bring it into captivity. That means imprison those thoughts by the blood of the Lamb, and the, into Jesus Christ. Plead the blood against those demonic thoughts. Cast it down. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 and 5. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. The mind is the battlefield. It is vital necessity that we line up our thoughts with God's thought. It is very important it is necessary. It should take precedence, priority over anything you think about to line your thought life up with God's thoughts. And the only way that's going to happen is the process we take 
to study God's word and spend time in prayer and consecration, seeking the face of God. Don't ever give up because little by little you are changing. Some people, when they don't see the results in their lives that they're expecting, they give up too quick. And I was just talking to someone not long ago, letting them know that just because you, you gave your life to Christ doesn't mean the enemy not going to stop attacking you. Matter of fact, he's going to attack you even more because you made a decision to give your life to Jesus. So the moment you give your life to Jesus, the enemy comes along and says, you know what? I'm going to hit them even harder with a fatal blow. I'm going to bring all the things that they love the most. I'm going to bring the people around me that's going to cause them to fall. I'm going to do everything I know to entice them. God puts it this way in the book of James. I'm going to go to the scripture, James chapter 1. In James chapter 1, it puts it this way. Hallelujah. It says in verse 12, Blessed is the man, James chapter 1, verse 12. Blessed is the man that endures temptation. For when he is tried, that word means tested, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. So when you endure temptation, when you have been tried, tested, and proven, God says a crown of life waiting for you. That he promised you. Verse 13. It says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempts he any man. Verse 14. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then, verse 15, then when lust has conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So what it's talking about, when you have went through this process of sin, of being tested and tried, and you didn't give in to truth, it says, you know what's going to happen? When sin is done, taking this course in your life, it's going to kill you. So you have a choice to recognize the spirit of Christ that's in you or to keep giving in to the spirit of the enemy. And in the Amplified Version, it puts it this way. It says, verse 14, but each one is tempted when he is dragged away and enticed and baited to commit sin by his own worldly desire, passion, and lust. Then when the illicit desire has conceived, that's your sinful desire, your wicked desire, it gives birth to sin. So sin brings forth babies. Didn't know that, did you? Your sin produced babies. And the babies that's birthed to sin, when it has ran its full course or matured, it says, gives birth to death. So you're going to birth babies of sin in your life by giving it to the illicit desire and then the illicit desire when it's finished maturing the babies it's going to produce death that's how the enemy operates in our lives because he wants you to get to the place where you don't recognize how much you need God in your life so you shut God's voice out to keep from listening to him when the spirit inside of you we all have the Holy Spirit living inside of us the moment you give your life to Christ when the spirit comes inside of you the Holy Spirit tells you the enemy is trying to entice you the enemy trying to lure you into a trap. The enemy trying to destroy you. The enemy sending people in your life that you don't need to listen to. The enemy whispering stuff in your ear that's not of God. You need to shut it down. Some of this music we listen to is illicit because it, it produces thoughts of sex and molestation, all these different things. All, all kinds of stuff come through music. But you got to govern your spirit by what you're allowed to go into your ear gate. Whatever it is you feed your ear gate with gets into your spirit. And it produces desires, either godly desires or demonic desires. And whatever it is, when it gets into your spirit, it will destroy you. Then verse 16, it says, do not 
be misled, my brothers and sisters. You have a, th have a choice. You have a choice. Either you're going to be misled or don't be, be misled by the enemy. It's up to you. So don't give up when you see little progress when you're trying to make a change in your life because it's a process. Salvation is a process. The initial point of giving my life to Christ is the ultimate point of coming to Christ. Now it's a process. It has to go forth every day of being saved from the mind of the world, the mind of the flesh, all the different things that the enemy brings into our life. We got to learn how to overcome them things and how to give into Christ's authority. So it's up to you. Chapter one, the mind is the battlefield. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, contending only with physical opponents, but against dispositions, against the powers. And that dispositism is those, those stern rulers in authority. So we, we come against them, against the powers, against the master, the master spirits who are the world rulers of this present darkness, and against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly supernatural fear. So there are spiritual forces that are opposing God that's around you. That's what the word is talking about. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12. These demonic forces are atmospheric demonic, uh, demonic spirits that surround you who are working to contend with the spirit of Christ inside of you. So the Holy Spirit in Ephesians chapter 6, he teaches us how to arm ourselves to be defensive against the enemy. But if you don't take the time out to get in God's word, how are you going to know how to defeat your enemy? It is impossible to fight a spiritual war with the physical components. You must get into the spiritual aspect of your mind and allow the Holy Spirit to govern your thought life to fight against the demonic forces that are coming against you, these rulers and these wicked forces of darkness, and to stand armed with the power of the Lord, guarding you, protecting you, shielding you, and embracing you in God's presence. Otherwise, you leave yourself vulnerable. And the enemy knows exactly what error in your life to target. He knows the weakest error of your thought life that governs your life, that he knows where he can attack the most that will cause you to fall. Everybody on this line, everybody in our churches, everybody in our community, every person we're connected with have a thought life and an error in their life where they're weakened the most. Some might be inferiority, afraid to stand up in public speaking, or, or be little even when people talk about you. Poor self-esteem. There's so many different errors in our lives where we beat one another down and we don't realize that might be the very error that hurt them the most because there was a child with the same thing. There are so many different people being abused as children and the same thing governed their lives in their adult life. And God says the only way to overcome that spirit is to recognize that's a breach in your heart and allow the Holy Spirit to come into that area of your heart to seal the breach with the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus comes in with the agents and the nutrients of the blood and begins to seal. Just like when you cut yourself. Your body has some white cells and some red cells. So the cells in your body begin to target the air that's been cut and cause the bleeding to stop. Because it's designed to heal itself. The same way the blood of Jesus is, it's designed to heal you of itself because when you trust in God's word and you give that error to him he said I know where you've been targeted at I know where you've been hurt at I know where you've been abused at I know where you've been scarred at there's been a scale in this area a scab in this area he said I'm going to come into that very area in your life that you haven't let go of I'm going to reveal it to you not only when I reveal it to you I'm going to cause your thought life to change Begin to meditate on the word of God to receive healing. God says, I sent my word to heal you and deliver you from all destruction. So if God sent his word, it's a guarantee the word can heal you in those areas when we trust him. 
From this scripture, we see that we are in a war. A careful study of this verse informs us that our warfare is not with human beings, but with the devil and his demons. Our warfare is not against people. So why do we fight people with people? When people come to you with a negative attitude, slandering, persecuting, hurting you, why do we retaliate in the same manner of force they bring to us? You know, I learned in security. When I did security for about, about 15 years, and I learned in security, we could not fight people with a different force that they didn't come to attack us with. If a person came and they want to fight us with their fists, we have to defend ourselves with our hands. But if they came with a weapon, then we were ordered to take out our baton or our, or our, our weapon or, or a gun or whatever it is we had, taser, whatever, and use equal amount of force to defend ourselves against the opposing force. The spiritual world is the same way. The enemy comes to you through other people that's a demonic influence inside of them to attack you. You must attack them with an equal force, which is the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God inside of you is greater than he that's in the world. Because the Bible tells us that Jesus conquered all of our foes. And he sat down at the right hand of the Father and majesty on high. So if Jesus conquered all of our foes and ascended to heaven and sat out in a place of authority, guess where you're seated? You're seated in a place of authority. So all you got to do is sit down and rest in the finished work that's already won the battle. So when they come at you, I plead the blood of Jesus against that spirit right now in Jesus' name. I'm not going to entertain you today. Satan, the Lord rebuke you. Guess what happens? The enemy in them is shut down. Because you're standing on God's word. His defensive mechanism. The full armor of God activates upon your life. And begins to repel the enemy that's coming against you. This is good teaching tonight. I don't know if y'all receive it. But I receive it myself. Because God is, is telling us something. We got to learn how to know our enemy. We got to know how to fight our enemy. We got to know how to govern our thought life. Because you cannot fight the enemy with a physical force. You got to fight it with the spirit. Because the flesh opposes the spirit of God. And the Spirit of God opposes the flesh. And they said, both are in war against each other because one wants to control your life. Whichever one you give the power to, you become the slave of that thing. So if you give your life over to the Holy Spirit, you become a slave to the Holy Spirit in righteousness. But if you give yourself over to the mind of the flesh, which is hostile, an enemy of God, you become a slave to your flesh. But to the demonic force, the enemy that's working in your life. Our enemy, Satan, attempts to defeat us with strategies and defeat us through well-laid plans and deliberate on purpose deceptions. The enemy wants to deceive you on purpose. You know one thing I learned from a brother about a few months ago? When he got ready to hang up from the phone call, he said, make it a great day on purpose. And I thought about that. I said, that makes so much sense. Because we can make our day a negative day on purpose. Why can't we make it a positive day on purpose or a great day on purpose? And it all originates with the thought life. However you think your life, your day is going to be, that's what you're going to command it to be. You can command your day. I command my day to be peaceful every day. I command my house to be a habitation for the Lord, that God's present and well. And guess what? When people come into my house, they said, man, your house is clean, it's different, it's quiet, it's peaceful. They find my house a place of peace when they come into my house. Why? Because I've governed my mindset to believe in my heart that God's a dog would keep me in perfect peace with my mind and stayed on him. So when you allow your mind to stay on the Lord, guess what happens? God sets your atmosphere a place of peace. So if anything try to infiltrate your structure, the peace of God will shut it down every time. The devil is a liar. Jesus calls him the father of lies. And of all that he is, is false. John 8, 44. He lies to you and he lies to me. He tells us things about ourselves, about other people, and about circumstances that are not true. 
He does not, however, tell us the entire lie all at one time. He begins by bombarding our minds with cleverly devised patterns of little nagging thoughts, suspicions, doubts, fears, wandering, reasoning, and theories. He moves slowly and cautiously. After all, well-laid plans take time. Remember, he has a strategy for his warfare. He has studied us for a very long time. The enemy knows you. The enemy studies you. He, he watches you. He, the, the, uh, James uh, chapter 5, I believe it talks about the, the enemy is like a roaring lion seeking who he may devour. So the enemy studies you. He's looking for a place in your life where he can come in and pounce on you and destroy you. But it's up to you to make a decision. Am I going to give into the voice of the enemy? Or am I going to give into the voice of the Lord? You have a choice to make within yourself. To allow the spirit to lead and direct you in the pathway of truth and righteousness. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Okay, James chapter 4 verse 7. It says, resist, it says, it says submit therefore yourself to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your way, your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. So the enemy... He knows exactly what area in your life that he can get in and attack you the most to cause you to stop trusting and depending on God in your life. But I tell you to tell you the truth. Satan, as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, he's looking for you. He's looking for you because he knows that I can stop you in your track. He, he knows I can stop you. I can destroy you. He can lead you astray. He can lead you to the pathway of destruction. He knows exactly what it is. First Peter chapter 5, verse 8. It said, be sober, be di diligent, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. First Peter chapter 5, verse 8. And you gotta be aware of your adversary. Remember. He knows what we like and what we don't like. He knows our insecurities. He knows our weaknesses and our fears. He knows what bothers us the most. He is willing to invest any amount of time it takes to defeat us. One of the devil's strong points is patience. One of the devil's strongest points is patience. He's waiting on you. He knows what you what you like the most, and he's going to wait, and he's going to sit back and watch you, see when he can get his opportunity to come into your life and lead you astray. That's what he does because he, he's looking. He's searching. He wants you. He wants you to fall. He wants you to mess up. He wants you to make a mistake so he can come in and have his way. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 27. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 27. says, neither give place to the devil. Verse 28, let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the things which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. So in other words, the devil knows what you like. He's waiting on you. And, and God is warning us, don't open up the door. When he comes delivering packages to your house, return the sender. Tell him we're not taking it anymore. I'm taking back my thought life. I'm taking back my life. I'm taking back my family. I'm taking back my health. I'm taking back my job, my benefits. I'm the head and not the tail. I'm above and not beneath. I'm the lender and not the borrower. I'm taking back my covenant with God. And you can't have it anymore. And when you make that decision within yourself to stand on God's word, I guarantee that God's word will prevail in your life and the enemy will be defeated every single time. And God will bring you through victoriously. So it's up to you to make that choice today. To stand on God's word or resist him. 
But the more power you give to the enemy, the more he comes into your life. What God says today is up to you to make a decision within yourself. I'm going to trust God in his word. I'm going to stand on his word. I'm going to decree his word and know with confidence what God says about me, it is for me. <laughs> so as we get ready to come to a close, we'll pick this up on next week, tearing down, tearing down, which is a thought life. We're going to tear down the thought life of the enemy. We're going to talk about that on next week. But if you don't know Jesus is your Lord and Savior, I want you, and you are a backslider, I want you to repeat this prayer after me. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I acknowledge that I'm a sinner or I'm a backslider. And I ask you to come into my heart, forgive me for my sins, knowingly and unknowingly, and to wash me in the blood of the Lamb. And I thank you for cleansing me in the blood and, and, and ask you to come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. And I thank you for saving me. Now, Lord, fill me with the Holy Spirit that he would have power and control of my life and my thought life and that I can be filled with your power to be a witness for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you pray that prayer, welcome to the family of God. And each week I also give an opportunity for those who want to sow into the ministry. I posted a link on Facebook here that um, you can sow a seed. It doesn't matter the amount of the seed, but whatever you trust in God to do in your life. And you believe in God for a breakthrough, for a miracle, for God to show up in a situation that you're dealing with. By faith of sowing your seed, God is going to do that. God instructed me to make this notation each week to give people an opportunity to sow a seed. The seed doesn't go to me, it goes to the ministry. Every seed that you sow goes right, right back into the ministry for materials and, and for our Sunday school, Sunday school lessons things of that sort. So I encourage you, give, not, I, not grudgingly or necessity, but give as God entrusted you to do and trust God in his word that every seed that you sow, God will produce a harvest in return because the Bible tells us, Luke 6, 38, give and will come back to you, good measures, pressed down, shaken together, and running over your men, given to your bosom. In other words, God promises he was going to cause people to give into your life by any other source, the way he chooses to bless you, to meet your need. I'm a living witness. When I first moved here four years ago, my apartment got filled by faith, by sowing seeds. I, I believe that God honors that. He, he, he approves that. And he blesses that. So you stay encouraged. And you pray and ask God to move upon your heart. If he wants you to sow a seed, sow a seed. And expect God in return to bless you. Because he said, we're blessed coming in, we're blessed going out. We're blessed in the city, we're blessed in the field. So everything you touch from this day forth, I command the blessing to be upon you by faith in Jesus' name. And Lord God, I thank you right now that every person that sows a seed into this ministry, oh God, will re receive a harvest of blessing in return, that you will meet their every need, financially, spiritually, emotionally, mentally, physically, God, doesn't matter what it is that trust you to do, God, you will do it according to your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And until next week, you all stay encouraged, stay excited about Jesus, and know that I love you and God loves you too. And if you get a chance, share this video with somebody else that they will begin to hear the word of God to help change their thought life as well. And until next week, shalom. Peace be unto you.